welcome to That Season Air podcast. I'm your host Gina. Stick with me as I chat to season airs, expats and adventurers across the world sharing their inspiring stories and interesting insights into living and working abroad. On today's show, I got a call from all the way over in Australia from former season air Bryce Russell. My helmet was gone as well. I woke up and I looked at the black and I was like, oh, that, that was pretty bad. And then I didn't know that while I was unconscious, the fuel had leaked all over my legs. And then when I woke up, the uh, black pretty much, you know, I exploded. Oh my God. And my legs caught fire. Wow. Yeah. That is horrendous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too fun. Bryce runs us through his travels, including seasons in Canada and Australia. Tune in as Bryce shares his story from terrible waiter to winemaker and stick with us right to the end of the show to hear tales of shady season air accommodation and dodgy landlord dealings. This podcast is supported by Dope Snow. This week, the team will be in Austria hitting up the Maria Alm and Westendorf for more community days. For a full list of events this season, check out the link in the show notes below. And without further ado, here's the show. Bryce Russell, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you very much. I'm going good. How are you? I'm pretty good today. Yeah, just uh, trying to figure out this technology, but uh, it's going well, I think, so far, but we don't want to jinx it. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You were obviously nominated on the episode with Carl O'Dwyer, yeah. the Irish speed skier, because you've met him on seasons previously. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally and what's your current situation? Uh, I'm originally from a small town of, called Kangarilla in South Australia. Mm -hmm. It's in the Adelaide Hills. Currently, I'm working at a winery in the McLaren Vale wine region in South Australia as a cellar hand. Okay. And as I said, you've done uh, quite a few seasons in various different countries. What was it that first sparked your interest into living and working abroad? When I started uh, working in wineries, I used to always, when it came for harvest or vintage time, they'd always hire internationals. And so I started in the wine industry when I was 17 and all these like South African and um, the people from South America had always come and work for the, I think it was about 10 to 12 weeks. And they just tell me the stories and I just keep thinking, well, oh, maybe, maybe I could do that one day and travel around the world and work in wineries. That's kind of how it all, it all began. And what sort of age were you when you went out on your first season? Uh, I was 20. All right. So pretty young. <laughs> Yeah, it was my first time living at a home. And did you go to university or anything like that? Like, what was your original thoughts? Or was that always kind of the plan that you were going to go out? You'd been exposed to these kind of people from different parts of the world and you were just like straight away, like, I want to do that. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I think um, I was talking to the winemakers where I worked about it. And one of the winemakers there had worked in Canada at a winery. And the winemaker over there was from Adelaide as well. It was, it was actually very easy to get a job i just sent the resume and she went yep no worries and there was no interview interview or anything so i was kind of just like oh okay i'm going to canada it was yeah yeah it was great yeah awesome awesome so yeah so tell us a bit about your first season whereabouts did you go and what were you doing i was in a place called or town called oliver just near the border to the to the states and that was like the wine region it's called the okanagan it's a giant valley just full of wineries. Mm -hmm. And I was in a place called, a winery called Jackson Triggs. And I was there for about, I think maybe eight weeks. And I lived in um, like staff accommodation. And that was, uh, yeah, my first real eye-opening thing about uh, the seasonal life was shared accommodation and all that. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> what was the kind of situation there? Describe it for us. Uh, it was a house on top of a hill in the middle of nowhere that the winery had owned and me having no idea about buying a car over there or anything same with the other I only lived with two other people at the time and we had to get a $60 taxi to town each way to get our groceries until we um finally decided to buy a car oh, between wow. the three of us so uh yeah we definitely needed to buy a car <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so was that a winter season or was that summer season? Like what time of year was it that you went to? Uh, it was around the mid to end of August. Mm -hmm. I left that job to start my first ski season. Right. Okay. So it was around 
mid November, I went up to the ski teams. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't like you had a passion for snow sports or anything like that at that point. You just wanted to go and travel around and see different places. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I pretty much had never really seen snow at all. Oh, really? I did a Kentucky when I was 19 and I saw it for a, maybe from a distance. And I think there was a bit of really old snow on the ground. Yeah, I think I had really no plans to do a ski season. And then the people that I was with were just like, oh, we're going up to Big White Ski Resort for the winter. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll come along <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So tell us about where you went after that first uh, experience away. We did a uh, winter season at uh, Big White. When I first, uh, I remember we went up there to look for a job and we stayed in the hostel and I got a job that day because I just wanted to, I just said I'll get whatever and managed to get myself a dishy job. We stayed in the hostel and it snowed and it was the first time I've ever been in actual like snowing and I was yeah. like a little kid. I was just running around doing snow angels <laughs> <laughs> and throwing snow, throwing snowballs at people I didn't even know. Like just, <laughs> just, just causing yeah. havoc. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, pretty much. Yeah. There was a few beers involved as well, but, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was like, yeah, I was so happy. It was awesome. Yeah. So you went there, that's a totally new experience for you. When did you decide to, did you already know before you went, right, I'm going to give like skiing or snowboarding a go, or were you just there just to be somewhere different? Pretty much, yeah, just to be somewhere different. And then mm -hmm. the people I was with were all snowboarders. So then they kind of helped me out getting all the right gear. And I think I bought a snowboard off a mate and I had never skateboarded, surfed or anything. So it was completely brand new to me and it took mm -hmm. me a long, a long time to pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took me absolutely ages. But did you have any lessons, or did you rely um, on your mates to teach you? <laughs> I uh, I did the the bad thing first and relied on my mates, and that was uh, mm -hmm. I think I did a thirty, but like maybe if you if you bombed the hill about thirty seconds, it took me about an hour and a half to get down it. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, that's I, like me. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. And then I managed to get a lesson for, for free through, I think, just the mountain. And it helped so much because they kind of really slowed everything down. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I do actually like snowboarding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is exactly <laughs> yeah. what happened to me as well. It's like I yeah. did two one week holidays with these groups of lads. They were trying to teach me and I just hated it and thought I was absolutely rubbish. And then, yeah, when I actually got some lessons, I was like, oh, yeah, it starts to click now. I wish I'd done this on the first holiday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think a few times when I've uh, when I was I've, I'd fall over and I just kind mm -hmm. of just thought to myself, why have I done this? <laughs> what? Yeah, I, exactly. Why am I here? <laughs> and then you get the lesson and you're like, oh, this is actually awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, um, what were you doing work wise on that season? And tell us a little bit about where you were living. I was living in an apartment just in the heart of the village was actually really good, uh, just with a, a friend that I lived um, or worked with at the winery. We got a mm -hmm. place together, a very small apartment, but it was very central, so it was great. And I was working as a dishy in a hotel called Hotel Bar that was right underneath where I was living, which was very, very convenient. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, washing dishes. How was that season overall? Because this is obviously, obviously your first winter season awesome i think like um everyone's there for a good time so you're always just having a lot of fun i think uh me being fresh living at a home i was very dumb with money i just spent way too much on nights out and having fun and yeah i was just pretty much living off trying to eat free food i was eating food off people's plates that they brought in from really <laughs> from the yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think I was just, yeah, I kind of came over with not much savings because I thought to myself, oh, I've got a job, I'll be okay. But I didn't really consider the wages I'd be on over there compared to wages in Australia. Oh, really? Was it quite different? I was on, yeah, $10 an hour, I think, as a dishy. So, yeah, compared to, I think you'd be on a, about 18 to $20 an hour in Australia doing that back then. Okay. So, yeah, a bit of a shock to the system. Very, very big shock to the system. <laughs> So after that first season, where did you go to after that? I uh, went to Kelowna for the summer. That's just only just down the hill, down the ski hill in the local city. Okay, so that's still in Canada. Yeah, still in Canada, yeah. And then um, was there with uh, Carl and we moved into a a very eventful house, share house. We, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us a bit about that. <laughs> well, usually I think 
when we were trying to find houses, most of them were year leases. And okay. we try to kind of uh, lie to the people, but they just thought we're foreigners. We're only here for the summer. Then we're going to go back to the ski resort. So we found this place. I think it was on Facebook, maybe. And then it was just month to month. So we thought, yeah, that's perfect. So we turn up and I think there was maybe, I think it was four of us. And he opens the door and it's this huge, as you walk into the front yard, there's gargoyles like hanging okay. on the fences and he's pretty much built, built it like a castle Oh wow! and he opens the door and he's looks like a very hungover man who was the owner of the house. Oh God. And he uh, gave us a tour and it was just this monstrous, huge house that was uh, pretty much, he built it to be a share house and um, he gave us a tour and then took us down to the basement where the bedrooms were and it was a home built nightclub. Oh, really? Yeah, he had the, all the walls painted. So you had a nightclub in the house? He did, yeah. And, and the bedrooms came off the nightclub. Oh, wow. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah, but he was saying, he said to us, he wants to calm down. He's not really into the partying anymore, which was a complete lie. But um, <laughs> so luckily we had these rooms that were kind of cut off to all the mayhem. A few of us did. But uh, it was, there was 15 people in the house. Oh, my God. And there were this, there was an Irish and a, other Canadian that kind of moved in at the same time and their bedrooms were sheets that he'd uh, made into like like cube sheets and he just charged them like 200 bucks a month or something to stay there oh my God. yeah he, it was a very very eventful house like a lot of uh yeah someone died in the house at one point um oh my goodness what happened uh, he overdosed there were, everyone was watching tv and he drank a smoothie or something and he was he was heavy into drugs and also like steroids and all that and i think he just had a big cocktail of something and he passed out on the beanbag in the living room and everyone thought he was sleeping oh my god my mate my mate put a blanket on him <laughs> thinking he was sleeping and uh they rolled him over a few hours later and he'd been dead for a while oh wow yeah it was a lot of uh that must strength have been, like pretty traumatic no <laughs> like yeah <wow. laughs> yeah it was uh yeah it was a, a very eventful house a lot of uh, yeah. parties that happened and you'd wake up at 6 a.m. for work and there'd be 15 people in the on the kitchen table doing every drug you could think of. And I'm kind of like, oh, hello. And some some blokes wearing my hat, wearing my hat. Another bloke was wearing my sunglasses. And I was like, oh, all right, fellas, I'll grab those off you. <laughs> like, <it> was, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to make, make my Cocoa Pops in the morning. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> everyone's around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a pr pretty crazy experience. Yeah, I bet. Was it actually, was there any part of that that was kind of good? Uh, it was, it was, yeah, good and weird. Like I met a bunch of other people that were living there that were actually not massive drug users. So they were, they were very nice and I'd still talk to them every now and now. And then now, and uh, yeah, it was just, had heaps of good nights, just all of us kind of hanging out. Yeah. Like walking downtown to the lakes and just, yeah, it was just, yeah, a cool house. And even though it was pretty crazy, but it was still... <laughs> Very uh, mem memorable place for sure. I'm sure, yeah. And the landlord, was he living in the same house as you or was he out and about? He had his own, I guess, separate quarters that he'd made at the front that was like only really like locked all the time. So you'd hear some very loud music and he'd come out very high on whatever he was on and trying to have a chat to us. And he used to uh, mm -hmm. sell our stuff if we left it out on Craigslist. Oh, really? What do you mean? Yeah. Um, a friend of mine had a laptop laptop bag uh, sold online because whatever he left out overnight, he'd come out drunk, high, grab what he could and uh, sell it online. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great place to live then. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting place to live. <laughs> we might have uh, returned the favour and sold some of his stuff, but I don't <laughs> want to get too, too far into that. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it was fair in love and war and all that um yep, yep. so so yeah overall how was that season though was it a good season snow wise how was your snowboarding getting on what was your experiences i think the first year well, i guess it was my first kind of real snow experience but it wasn't a good year for snow i was told okay it was pretty icy um wasn't really much snowfall at the during the year but i was all new to me so i just thought it was just snow in a way like i was very fresh to it all okay but i still had fun so. is, is that where you met carl yeah i met carl at big white he was a bartender and i was the dishy at the okay. a bar called globe yeah so after that season where what was the plan after that uh it was pretty much 
do the summer in Kelowna and then I was going to, I went back to do another vintage or harvest vintage, whatever you want to call it, um, back at the winery. Mm -hmm. And then I was, uh, yeah, and then I went back to Big White for another winter. Tell us about your next season in Big White. How was that? It was uh, a lot better. I stayed in a house with like Carl and a few other mates I've met from the season before. We had a nice, there was eight of us in the house, a really nice house, a bit more further away from the village, but still not like not a bad walk. I was a lot better at snowboarding, uh, which was good. Yeah. A lot more fun for me, I think, because we had like a little, like a little family in a way after a while and we had like Christmas dinners and stuff together and I had a better job. I was a, I was a waiter this time at the Irish bar. Oh yeah. That was owned by the, owned by the same people that worked at there when I was a dishy. To be fair, I was a, I was terrible. I was a very bad waiter, very bad server. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was, yeah. I was, yeah, everyone would, everyone would tell you the same. I was, my first year, I was, yeah, horrible. Why were you so bad? I just forget a lot of stuff, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> like, what, like I'd, writing, uh, not writing down orders and just like forgetting them or? <laughs> oh, just writing them down and also forgetting them. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> and just, um, just bad. I've never, never really did it before. So it was just trying to talk to customers. I was just, yeah, really bad at it and trying to explain the menu and stuff I just stutter a lot and I just forget I was notorious for being very bad at carrying coffees oh really yeah most of it would be on the saucer I was holding the saucer I'd just be shaking and I kind of walked very slow two hands on the saucer I was yeah useless um so uh is there anything about that season that was particularly different the snow the snow was I was told it was like one of the best in history the snowfall so I learned um falling over didn't hurt as much which was good just I was kind of a bit more confident in my riding, so I was trying to, I guess, progress a bit more. I wasn't being as cautious as I was my first season because it was, wasn't really was brand new. So I was trying to, you know, do a few tree runs and just trying to do some jumps and, yeah, mm -hmm. I think this was just want to really want to progress and get a bit better because all the friends I was with, they were, they were very good, very good riders. Really? And Carl, Carl being a very good skier. Yeah. <laughs> He was, uh, he was very fast skier. Yeah, it's very hard to keep up with him. I tell you that. <laughs> very hard. Awesome. Um, so after that season, where did you head to after that? Uh, Carl and I'm friend Phil. We both, um, just as the season ended, we flew to Thailand. Okay. And um, did a bit of backpacking around there. And uh, it nearly didn't happen because Phil and I uh, missed our flight <laughs> for the first one. Oh, no. Yeah, we had to book another one and wait 15 hours in a very, very small airport. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, dear. And had you saved up for this trip? or? Oh, uh, yes. I was a lot better with money then. Still didn't have as much as I wanted, but I wasn't as kind of stupid with it, you know, yeah, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> the waiter job paid off then. <laughs> Yes, oh, for sure. Even though, yeah, my, my t even though my tips are pretty terrible because I was a terrible server, which is fair, but um, <laughs> I still awesome. made a bit more than I than I thought, which was good. Yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about the trip to Thailand because I was reading the email that you sent me. Um, so yeah. you went to Thailand and Vietnam, is that right? Uh, yeah, we uh, did. Oh, I'm not too sure where we started, but we did like um, through the islands in Thailand and. Did the you know the usual full, full moon parties and all that fun stuff and just oh, I'm trying to remember it's all a bit of a blur because we had a few it was a few beers on the trip but um yeah <laughs> yeah we so did a few um, boat cruises and a few party boats and pretty much just mm -hmm. travelled around and and then Vietnam we went to Vietnam we bought motorbikes we rode from the top to the bottom mm -hmm. over a couple couple of weeks and just went at wherever we could and just it was awesome yeah. It's a great trip. When that trip was coming to an end, what was the plan after that? Uh, we were going to go back to uh, Canada and do another summer season in Kelowna. That was the original plan. <laughs> yeah, but what happened? Uh, on the very last day of riding the bikes, we were about an hour out from the last place we were going to, because we got told when we bought the bikes at the top, we would have no e issue when we got to the bottom just to sell them off to another other person that wanted to do the same thing as us. But um, we got we went on the wrong highway and we got turned around because it was no motorbikes allowed or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing a U-turn and I guess I didn't see the amount of traffic that was coming and I clipped the back of a scooter while I was doing the U-turn. It wasn't like a big collision. I just kind of knocked his back wheel, got a bit of a speed wobble, and then I went headfirst into a ditch 
you know, about five feet, about five feet deep. Uh, it was ne- right next to a uh, guardrail, but I just got, went past the guardrail and then uh, blacked out when I went over and I woke up and the bike was leaning on me. I wasn't trapped or anything. The kind of bike was just leaning on me and I kind of went, oh, my helmet was gone as well. I woke up and I looked at the bike and I was like, oh, that, that was pretty bad. And then I didn't know that while I was unconscious, the fuel had leaked all over my legs. And then when I woke up, the uh, bike pretty much, you know, I exploded. Oh, my God. And my legs caught fire. Wow. Yeah. That is horrendous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too fun. Well, you woke up just in time to see all of this as well. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. I pretty much uh, woke up, the big boom happened, and I jumped out, and then both my legs were on fire. And I wasn't – I had one shoe on, and my sock was covered in fuel. So that kind of – I got – Oh, my God. I was grabbing leaves and branches from trees that were, like, hanging over the – ditch i was using that to pat me out and then car I remember car yelling your socks on fire so then i had to look down and i kind of i remember ripping my sock off and throwing it and it was like a fireball in the distance Ooh. and then i kind of once i was all out i kind of went oh and it was uh yeah, yeah not good because all my hands were wow. were up as like burnt from patting myself out yeah well it's lucky you did wake up at that point i guess otherwise oh definitely it yeah. been a very different story oh yeah but man, definitely that for sure. is brutal <laughs> like <that> is... <laughs> yeah oh, no, it didn't tickle scary, to be that. honest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man so then yeah so where were you at this point we were in vietnam yeah in vietnam yeah yeah you must have been in pretty bad shape yeah pretty much i had um i wasn't too sure how the bad the burns were when it all happened uh, i had to get mm. some random vietnamese guy put me in the back of his scooter and took me to a hospital and then when I was there, they just kind of wrapped me in betadine bandages. And then I think the pain had kicked in by then. And that was, yeah, it wasn't too fun. Yeah. And then um, they shipped me to a hospital in, I think it was Ho Chi Minh City. And I was there for about a week, I think, wow. because uh, they weren't really taking very good care of me. <laughs> they, um, oh, really? Yeah, they let me, they let my mates like Carl and Phil visit me an hour a day to kind of keep me in track, like up to date what's going on because they were sorting really? out my travel insurance. Okay. You had insurance? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Otherwise, I would be dead, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, so they were allowed in one hour a day. What was the care like in that hospital? Um, I don't think they liked me because I was a Westerner and I had my own private room, I think, because they had like other – people with burns I think I was in the burns ward I'm guessing because I was like as I got reeled in there was people in hallways like on beds it was like really busy and I think they just wouldn't didn't like me because I had my own big separate room right and I think when it comes to like looking after patients in the hospitals there I'm not too sure but I think it's more like rely on family to kind of mm-hmm. feed you and give you water and everything so they pretty much told my mates to buy a big jug of water and because my hands were bandaged, I couldn't really give myself any food or drink. Wow. So the nurses would just give me, a, I think it was like a rice kind of slop meal, and just put it on my chest and walk away. So I kind of had to ask them to feed me and they weren't really happy about that. And uh, it was like, yeah, ants in my room. It like rained inside the room at one point. Wow. Yeah. That's was, a pretty uh, uh, tough experience, eh? Hey? Yeah, it wasn't too fun. But I didn't, I didn't know until I think I was about – to leave that there was an international hospital like just down the road so oh, really? i was like yeah i was like why didn't i go there <laughs> <laughs> wow that is just like mm. not a great situation to be in and you said in your email they gave you a 50 50 chance of actually surviving is that right yeah yeah about that because um they didn't really do much to do with um taking care of me in vietnam so when i got flown i had to get many vapped back to australia and I was still covered in dirt from the accident a week later when I got back because they didn't they don't take care of you because they rely on the family so I was still dirty, right? And I had an infected drip and everything, so all the burns just kept that weren't really healing because they had nothing, but they wouldn't really take care of me. So I got um, infections like a flesh eating virus. I had all this stuff that fights off all antibiotics, so it was pretty much yeah, fifty uh, fifty. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you get taken to Australia, and how does it go after that? Um, I was in the Adelaide uh, Burns Ward for two months. Mm-hmm. Um, I had 
a few attempts at fixing my legs. I think at one point they were going to just take them off. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, really? I think it was a last-minute decision before they um, <laughs> decided to keep them. That is so scary. Oh, my mm. God. You must have been, yeah, not a good situation yeah. to be in. Nah, well, because I think I was kind of just kept trying to be positive. I really had no idea. I was like, oh, I'll be okay. But mm. which kind of, I guess, got me through it. But um, I was there for yeah, two months. I had got skin grafts on both my legs now from pretty much my hips down to my ankles all the way around. Yeah, and then I got, took that off my back and I was uh, had to learn how to walk again and do lots of that six months of rehab. Wow. Awesome. And how are you now? Yeah, all good. Yeah, back to work. That is quite a story <laughs> yeah. man like you just yeah. don't expect something like that to happen on oh like, no yeah going traveling having a bit of fun and then all of a sudden everything changes oh yeah yeah it was uh i guess in a way it was a free trip home but it wasn't the other uh, best way to get a free trip home no <laughs> no it was a lot you had to go for a lot to get that free trip home. yeah yeah i just tell people i got a private jet <laughs> Well, I like your positive attitude that came out of that anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, man, that must have been super, super scary. So uh, mm. yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. And yeah, we're good. I'm so glad to hear that you're all right. That, <laughs> yeah. uh, that was a close one, eh? It was a very close one, yes, definitely. <laughs> awesome. So after that, you recover. What is your plans once you've recovered? Um, well, pretty much, I remember when... I was in the hospital with the doctor said, I said to the doctor, like, am I, can I snowboard again? And he said, yes. And I was like, all right, I'm going back to Canada. So I, um, mm -hmm. once I could, uh, my legs were okay and I could kind of work, I went back to the winery back in Australia, I went back to that winery, worked to harvest there, saved up like a smart, more mature man I was <laughs> after all that. <laughs> Actually had some money this time and um, I had a mate join me this time and we worked a vintage and then we went to Canada and worked another vintage. It wasn't, I didn't stay in the same shared like accommodation I was like last time I went. They had this winemaker that was there that was very religious and didn't like putting guys and girls together when it came to staff accommodation. So there were two houses, roughly similar, similar in size. There was 11 guys in one and two girls in the other. And so you can imagine 11 guys all working at the same job under the age of 25 um the house was an absolute shambles <laughs> oh dear <laughs> yeah well no one died which was good but uh yeah. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> gotta look at the positives exactly Man. exactly yeah christ you've seen a lot hey <laughs> <laughs> a lot of interesting things have happened yes um so this was the summer season is that right yeah summer kind of autumn kind of getting into the autumn like um mm -hmm. so it's pretty much what we usually do is we wear work a vintage in canada and then it kind of leads us into going back up to do another ski season with the summer autumn type season how does that kind of differ from like a ski season what do you get up to in your free time for example <laughs> we just kind of hang out by the lake and just chill just sit outside and because of where we were we were in a vineyard that was owned by the winery and we weren't allowed outside because there was too many black bears because it was a uh a two driver summer so they kind of the bears would break into the vineyard and eat all the grapes oh really but us all being foreigners we'd all see a bear and we'd all just run out and go and chase after it <laughs> try and get photos what <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's logical yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah, we weren't really a smart bunch when it came to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So any weird encounters with bears or everything goes smoothly? <laughs> yeah. Getting your well, selfies. We kind of, yeah, we kind of just made sure there were small bears, which probably wouldn't, really wouldn't really help. But um, <laughs> just kind of, <laughs> we'd all just run after and be like, it's a bear, it's a bear. And we would do, we'd all just run out from where we're going and chase the bear and get a photo and go back inside. And that was kind of just what we did. And we kind of, me and my mate bought a minivan, so we'd all just pile into the minivan and go to the, go to the local bar and run a muck and just kind of explore around and go to different wineries and just kind of yeah, chill in the sun before it got snowy very quickly. Uh, so, yeah, not advisable to go chasing after bears for anyone listening. I do not recommend it. No. <laughs> <laughs> not recommended. Yeah. So tell us about what a 
working day looks like in the winery? Because it's during vintage, it's pretty much all harvest. It just pretty much means the grapes are ready to get picked. So um, we didn't work in the vineyard, so the grapes were picked and then brought to us. And we would um, pretty much process it. We'd go through a machine which would separate all the grapes from all the stalks and other organic matter that would be in there. And then uh, it would go into a fermenter if it was for red wine. It would go into a press if it was white grapes and it gets squished straight away and made into white wine. And we'd just do the whole process, like fermenting, put it into a press and we have to dig it out. Sometimes we'd be digging maybe like five to six tonne of grapes in one tank. Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty funny. It's a very dirty job. It's uh, You get covered in grapes and sometimes mm-hmm. things go wrong. And I've had a, many, many showers of wine before. Really? Yeah, when you are... Uh, some person's transferring wine from one tank to another with a pump and uh, they're not, not really looking after it very well and you kind of fill one tank and then you transfer it to another one. And the only way to, to start the transfer, if it's overflowing, is to get underneath it, underneath the waterfall and then kind of divert it to another tank. So I've had, uh, I've been, yeah, I've been covered head to toe in white, white grape juice, red wine, fermenting wine. I've, yeah. Do you drink wine? Uh, yes, I do. It took me a while to, you know, to start drinking it because I... Probably sick of the sight of it, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And then because uh, well, I started when I was 17 and I was all about just drinking vodka and all that. And, and I worked in a place that was very, very heavy red wine. And I just thought, well, who would want to drink this? So I never really explored it too much until I went to Canada. And they're there. it's a bit cooler there. So the wines aren't as bold and a lot more kind of sweeter wines there, so it kind of got me into it a bit more. Okay. But it took me three years of working in the industry to actually enjoy drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, cool. Would you describe it as quite hard work and, like, is the pay worth it? Is it something that you'd recommend people to do? Or? Oh, 100%. Like, the um, it kind of all depends on where you are with the kind of the wage-wise. Like, Canada, it's not – the best but where you are is just beautiful so like i would do it all again i wouldn't yeah the wages mm-hmm. wouldn't mean anything to me if it's just you're in a giant valley surrounded by mountains and like snow-capped mountains it's beautiful so yeah but um australia if you want to do one in australia the if you go down to like the barossa valley the, it's, it is hard work but you're doing some places do 12 hours a day six days a week of just that you know, physical labor but uh it all comes clear when you get your first paycheck and you're like, I can, I can keep doing this. <laughs> like it's uh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Worth it. Oh yeah. Okay. So after that, what was the plan after that? Uh, yeah. So then we, me and my mate that I came over with, we did another uh, winter, I took him up to big white. We got a, did another winter season up there. He got a job uh, in a kitchen, been a kitchen hand. And I was a waiter again at the same bar mm-hmm. and somehow they yeah, hired me again to do the same job. <laughs> And did you get any better at it or uh, tips I, better? I think I was a lot better at it, to be fair, yes. I think uh, I had yeah, matured a bit over the last couple of years since I'd been there. So um, yeah, I think I felt a lot more confident and uh, I think I did a lot better. I didn't forget as many people's orders, which was good. <laughs> and my, my coffee holding skills were a lot better too. Yeah, and, the, and your snowboarding must have been pretty good by this point as well. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. It was a lot better, mm-hmm. I think, yeah. I was a bit nervous because... Um, with my legs because they're skin grafted my skin is really thin yeah. and so I was a bit nervous about falling over but I took a few big tumbles and it kind of made me a bit more confident to be fair doing big hits yeah. so that my legs would be okay so yeah definitely progressed a bit further with the snowboarding which was good and I did a lot more trips to other resorts because I wasn't stupid with money and I was able to actually do it okay yeah awesome was there any difference in that season uh, in big white to the others I think I was more, I guess, confident because I knew the place. I knew, like, it was also actually quite strange because I, with the visas, it's usually a two-year visa. Mm-hmm. And I was there, I did my two years, and then I had to go home from the accident. I think I missed a, I missed a season, and then I came back, and everyone that I'd worked with, their visas were up okay. the year before. So it was brand new people. It was just like a, a real strange experience to be in the same job be in the same environment, but we're just completely brand new people. And there was only, I reckon, maybe three or four people I knew there at the time from my other past seasons. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of like a, it was just a, I don't know, I didn't expect everyone to be there, but I thought I'd just have more people. But 
in a way it was good because I met another great bunch of people there, made heaps of heaps of good friends while I was there, I reckon, that season. Awesome. Um, so after that season, what was the plan after that? I think um, I just say the same thing over <laughs> and over again. Where That's did right. you go next? <laughs> uh, I kind of wanted to, I had some serious thoughts about um, trying to be a permanent resident in Canada. Okay. Because I just, yeah, just really just kind of fell in love with the whole place. And so I talked to the manager at the winery and I think in my head, someone told me that if you kind of stay at one place for a while, they can sponsor you to stick around. Okay, cool. So I messaged the manager and he said, yeah, we can get you a job. So I had to kind of hang around at the end of the season for a couple of weeks by myself, which got very boring. And uh, and then I had to yeah, try and I ended up finding a house in a town or a city called Penticton, which was kind of just a town next to the winery, and then got a kind of share house there with just one other bloke, which was good. I was kind of a bit sick of the big share houses by then. Yeah. And then uh, just, just for the next, I think, year and a half, maybe a year, I worked at the winery. Okay, and that was to try and get your residency in Canada. Yeah, yeah, and um, that didn't work out. But I, I did my first winter in um, a city. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't like I wasn't in a resort, so I just thought, oh, it's just snowy. It's just like a resort, but snowing in the city was just so much different because <laughs> it was. Oh, really? Just trying to live in the real world when there's you're waking up and there's twenty five centimeters of snow on the ground. And you have to drive to work. <laughs> like, yeah. like, and I me mean, being Australian and not having this like, South Australia get zero snow. And I, I just messaged my boss and I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not driving to, to work today. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Cause like you'd be, I'd be driving some days and I'd stop at an intersection and I wouldn't stop. <laughs> I'd hit the brakes and just keep yeah. going through. And I just kept thinking to myself, this is going to be me every day in the winter just trying to do everyday things like walking down the side, side of the road and you just fall over on the ice. Like it was, it was just a whole, whole new experience just kind of not being on the resort. And I just thought it'd be similar, but it was yeah, the complete opposite, mm-hmm. which was just very eye, eye, eye opening. Made me uh, realize what people say about um, seasonal depression. <laughs> it was just like, oh, okay. really? just like, yeah, it was just, I didn't, I didn't get it. I was like, cause I guess in Australia, it's cold, but it's not that bad. But I remember just being like, oh, man, like another snowstorm. Like, oh, I'm going to have to try and get all this snow off my car. Then I'm going to have to, like, pretty much drift to work <laughs> in my minivan. Yeah. Was, I was like, man, like, how do people do this? And it was, yeah, it was like dark all the time, driving past lakes that had no guardrails. So if I slid off, I'd just pretty much end up swimming in the lake. And Wow. Yeah, so bit scary <laughs> yeah and I was just yeah thinking to myself um, this is me like every day if I wanted to live here this would be me in the winter and I was like I don't know if I could yeah. actually do that but um yeah what happened is my actual role uh wasn't in the certain job requirements to get residency mm-hmm. I kind of found that out about two or three months before my visa ran out oh dear yeah but by then I'd um I'd met a uh, I met a woman <laughs> <laughs> She was uh, Australian as well. We actually um, grew up in the same town and were neighbours at one point. And I'd met her in the no winery. Way. Yeah, I'd met her in the winery in Canada. What? Yeah. Did you know each other? Uh, I knew her dad. I used to play social tennis with her dad. <laughs> small world. <laughs> yeah, very small world. Did you know she was over there? or? I, I kind of I was having lunch and a winemaker came in and he's like, oh, I've hired two South Australians uh, vintage. And I kind of, as a joke, I was like, oh, yeah, where are they from, Kangarilla? And he just went, yep. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and then so. Oh, my God, so random. I did the old Facebook stalk and I was like, I recognise that name. And then I saw a photo of her, of her with her dad and I was like, I know him. And so, yeah, it was pretty funny actually, yeah. Cool. So you guys met, hit it off. Yep. And then it kind of just worked out that yeah, my visa was running up. I wasn't going to stay. And so went back to Australia. We both met at um, Threadbow for my first or our first um, winter season in Australia. How did that differ? Yeah, because that's quite different again, even though it's in your home country, isn't it? It is, yeah. I think it made me realise I'm a bit of a, it makes you a bit of a snow snob in a way. Because <laughs> you, come, you come from Canada where the snow is just everywhere. And I went to Threadbow, you stay in, because obviously a big white, ski in, ski out. So you just ski to your your house you ski to your apartment and um in Threadbow 
I lived in a town called Jindabyne, which was about a half an hour drive away, kind of where, everyone, where most of the staff would stay if they didn't get like a mountain job and stay on the mountain. And so, yeah, half an hour drive. I worked at a place called Friday Flats. It was like where the beginner hill is. And it was like a cafe, bar, cafeteria kind of thing. I got there a bit later. I think it was about maybe a month or more into the season. And uh, my first day snowboarding, I was just kind of like, this isn't Canada. Like, what's, what's, what's this? And I was kind of like, <laughs> and I was kind of, kind of had to have like an internal like intervention with myself. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, you're in the snow. It doesn't matter. You're still snowboarding. Get over yourself. Yeah. It was a bit a bit like that, yeah. But it was still yeah, it was still fun, still awesome people there. Some days it was like it, it, towards the end of the season, they pretty much just build paths out of snow for you to be able to get from the top of the hill to the bottom. So it was that was very, very eye opening. Yeah. And then yeah, a lot of man made snow and yeah, a lot of rain. But you got um, over it. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah, I got over it. Yeah. Whatever I whatever I could get I was happy with. But I definitely didn't snowboard as much as I should have I think because I didn't have a car Ah, okay yeah that was only probably like three or four shifts a week and then I think I was paying 200 bucks a week in rent and coming from I didn't really have much money to begin with when I got back from Canada so it was kind of yeah felt like I was back to where I was my first season just a bit uh, a bit poor but luckily the really? wages yeah the wages were a bit better um mm-hmm. But also the cost of living being, yeah, uh, the uh, groceries and all that in Australia were, yeah, especially being like a small kind of uh, mountain town, it was, yeah, it was uh, expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it always is. It's like here, it's so expensive to just like, just to buy like a broccoli, it's like three euros or something. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just try and do your shop and you just, everything just adds up and you're like, oh, crap. Like, yeah. And especially yeah, the shifts are only five, six hours challenging definitely again at some points yeah yeah so what was the plan next after that uh i think we just um went back to adelaide and we did um it was kind of we timed it with vintage again in australia we left we stayed at Fredbo for kind of the start of the summer and we'd moved onto the actual mountain which was a lot of a better and I, I kind of in a way had a bit more fun in the summer because I think it was more of a smaller crew and I worked at a restaurant on the hill and got made good friends with the kitchen and stuff. I was a waiter. Once again, I was a bit better than the, the other time. Fantastic. <laughs> That's slow, good news. I'm, I'm slow, <laughs> slowly getting better at this point. <laughs> what sort of activities did you get up to in the summer there? Uh, just um, catching the chairlift, chairlift up to the top and kind of walking towards Kosciuszko, like the tallest peak in Australia, but it was pretty cool. They had this, uh, just kind of going for walks pretty much. It was really, really nice area in the summer. Tried a few wineries and just kind of going for drives. We'd go to Canberra, which a few trips there, me and the partner. It was funny, the first day of summer, it snowed on top of the hill. I thought it was pretty funny. Really? Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was just, yeah. It was also just weird being in the snow in Australia as well, like being from, because that was my first time in snow in Australia. Yeah, that's interesting. Being from South Australia where they'd have this event in winter where people would get really cold, which is zero here. People would go to this hill and they would camp, be there from maybe two in the morning and it pretty much looked like someone sprinkled icing sugar on the ground and there'd be new, news crews there going, oh, my God, it's snowed, it snowed in Adelaide. <laughs> And going from that to snowboarding in Australia was, yeah, in um, yeah, New South Wales was pretty funny. I bet, yeah. Was that the first time you did a bit of travelling around Australia as well? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Like um, I'd done a bit of driving around like the East Coast, but it was like a very speedy trip. But that was like the first time I kind of explored the mountains around New South Wales and Australia. So it was just weird to see hills mountains in Australia in a way for me because there's not really much of that back where I'm from it's just yeah rolling hills really so that was really cool and a lot of um just massive forests and the drive to Threadbow is beautiful as well lots of wildlife well wombats aren't really a thing in South Australia and the drive from Jindabyne to Threadbow is uh, actually very dangerous to be fair you'd finish work at night and there'd be wombats on the road emus kangaroos oh wow 
it's an 80, I think it's an 80K or 100K road, but you'd be going 60, right? Because it'd just be wildlife absolutely everywhere. And you'd, you'd drive to the resort in the morning and there'd just be so many dead wombats on the side of the road. Really? Oh, no. Yeah. And wombats are just giant balls of muscle. So you come off second best when you hit a wombat with your car. Oh, dear. Yeah, like, like hitting rocks. Oh, yeah. So there, that was uh, also yeah, very interesting to see. And um, Was that your last season? My last winter, that was, yeah, that was the last winter season. I did do a few trips. I did a trip up to a resort in Victoria last year, just like just to get back on the board, see if I still got the moves. But uh, yeah, that was good. And did you? Uh, yes. After a few falls, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> got back into it. Got back into it, yeah. It's like riding a bike, a very painful bike, yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, does that bring you to the present day or is there anything we've missed out? I did, um, we kind of timed finishing off at Threadbow. We did, my partner and I, because she works in the wine industry as well, so we got a job in the Barossa Valley. That's pretty much where you go to get a bit of money because the wineries are massive and the wages are good and you know you're, gonna, you're working pretty hard. And that was like... um. Stay over. Luckily, my mother lived pretty close to the winery, so we stayed with her and made us, in a way, kind of get back on our feet, back to getting into, I guess, the real world, back to the real world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, but that was kind of uh, when COVID started to happen. Okay. We were somehow essential worker. Keep everyone, I guess, I guess a lot of wine was drank during COVID, so I needed some wine. And uh, <laughs> so uh, that was, uh, we just kept going to work. Nothing really, it was really weird. I guess the winery didn't really know how to handle it because we'd had to do our usual team meetings and we'd be, you know, the 1.5 metres apart, but they'd be handing around a clipboard with a pen, with one pen to sign off your name that you were at the meeting. <laughs> so, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone knew how to handle it, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That <laughs> it is, was I guess a that very is true, weird yeah. time. Yeah, it was, it was very strange because what we – Everyone uses the same equipment. Everyone uses the same kind of like fittings of the winery that you need. And But we weren't allowed to talk to the shift like after us or before us. Mm-hmm. So we had to like write notes to each other. You'd then, they'd leave. You just pick up the same thing that they just wrote on. So you're still touching what they're touching, but you're just not seeing them. So it was the, it was kind of a very strange thing. Yeah. I guess, yeah, no one knew what to do. So, but yeah. Yeah, it was a weird time, weird time, yeah. but. You had to do your service, making sure there was wine for everyone. So, yeah, yeah thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, you're all welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of the wine drinkers. Um, <laughs> uh, right. So, does that bring us to the present day? Yeah, back in South Australia, back into where I grew up, and back into a nice small winery, and just trying to do the old fun adult life at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's a plan to kind of stay in your local area. I think I still want to, because my partner's um, a few years younger than me, she, she's studying winemaking at the moment at the university, so she wants to kind of get out there and travel around, do pretty much to kind of do what I did in a way, maybe in America or somewhere in Europe, you know, happily go along. Depends on my age, I'm getting close to the cutoff, I think, so. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, right, so I'm going to start going through the questions that I ask everyone now. No worries. From your experiences is there any tips you have for anyone on visa applications? I think just um, research before you apply because some documents take longer than others. For me, it was I got the ball rolling and some documents, like uploaded them and it says you've got this long to do your next one. And I was kind of like, oh, damn, I haven't even started looking it up. So then it was for me, it was the first time I got a visa, I was panicking because I didn't really have what I thought I needed. So I think in my second one, I was more prepared because I kind of knew. So I had everything ready to go, uploaded all at the same time. So I think for me, it'd just be figure out what you need before you get the ball rolling. So then you know you've got it all prepared straight away. Yeah, yeah. Because I had a few issues yeah, with Australians. I found a, few, a lot of people had this. It was um, when you need to upload a police certificate for the Canadian visa. A lot of people did the state one. You needed a federal one. And they got okay. a lot of people. So then... Yeah, but then with the time limit for that, it, like, yeah, made like, a few people panic. Yeah, yeah, because you need to, if you don't get the right one, you've only got a certain amount of time to get the next one. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's valid, right? So you have to make sure, yeah, definitely double check what you need before going yeah. into it. Because as you say, once you start the process, the ball starts rolling and yeah. you have a certain time limit limit to get it done. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah good advice. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if someone was planning to do one season, where would you recommend them to go and why? I guess for me it would be Canada because that's where I really have done most of my winters. Mm -hmm. There's so many resorts there and they're all very close to each other. So I would, I would say for me it would be a big wipe because it was ski in, ski out. It was just so cool to be able to snowboard into your building. And it was also pretty central to heaps of other resorts around because they're close to each other, kind of owned by similar people. They have reciprocals for cheaper lift passes and everything. So maybe traveling a little yeah, bit cheaper. So yeah, I reckon, definitely recommend yeah, Canada, kind of yeah, British Columbia. Yeah, nice. What was your best and what was your worst job and why? I think my best job was my being a waiter once I got good at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did enjoy uh, the people I worked with and the different customers I met. And then it was good because I've got a, a few bad reviews my first year. which <laughs> So I think I got a bit more confident and people actually liked me a bit more my second year. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a bit, bit better at my customer service, which was good. And I think my worst job was when I was living in Kelowna my first summer season. It was a bit kind of just like, I'll get any job. And my friend said, I've got a job at an agency. I can get you just kind of work different jobs, every kind of odd jobs every couple of days. And I went to this guy's shed. He had like a, I'm not sure what the business was, but he made me saw and count nuts and bolts for eight hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. That sounds very boring. It was very, <laughs> very boring. I had a few jobs like that. I was... um. I worked at a frozen tree farm for a couple of months. That was weird. Frozen tree farm? Yeah, they had boxes of frozen trees that kept dormant for when it was tree planting season. Okay. So my job in this giant freezer was to pull the pallets of trees out, let them defrost, but they were in cardboard boxes. So they'd get soggy, <laughs> the pallet would collapse, and the next day I'd come in and have to restack out all the soggy boxes. Oh, no. Yeah, and then I had to load about 8,000 trees a day into a truck. Trees were only oh small, but in small boxes, but there was a little bit. That is super random. Yeah, I did, all, <laughs> I did a lot of random jobs, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah. Kind of, Any more random jobs that you want to tell us about? <laughs> I laid turf for this guy. <laughs> I cleared out a telecom place that had heaps of computers I had to load up and I built a shipping container model home for some internet company. It was whatever they gave me, I'd just do it. <laughs> a lot of a lot of bad ones. I can tell you that. Yeah, sounds like it. Actually, I, I did I did work in a um a weed farm. I don't know how you call it, like a a marijuana crop plant <laughs> for one day. Oh, really? Yeah. One day. Yeah, just actually, it was my landlord, that crazy landlord I had. <laughs> shock <laughs> yeah and um we loaded up into his van that he had and we drove to this it was actually government run so this one was legal surprisingly mm -hmm. i was just trimming plants putting them in planter boxes and it was just amazing to me because obviously it's illegal here in australia so it was yeah very eye-opening and then we got into his van again and we went to this uh not legal one and <laughs> It was a guy's carport with um, foil on the walls. My job was to install a air conditioner because it was too hot in there. Okay. And he gave me a roll of tape and was like, we're going to tape this vent that was about six inches diameter and we have to tape it to mm -hmm. this air conditioner, which was about a two-inch diameter. And he just gave me a roll of tape. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't the smartest man. Yeah, that was. Oh my yeah. god! And that was one of the yeah, probably one of the worst jobs I reckon because it was just weird. Yeah, but also pretty funny. <laughs> um, so throughout your experiences, where's the best place you've ever visited and why? I reckon it'd probably be Banff because mm -hmm. it was just it's just everywhere you look is a postcard picture. Like it was just really beautiful, and there's so much like wildlife, and it was yeah, mental, and probably. I was driving, I'm not too sure where this is, but I was driving to Whistler from where I was living. I went the back way and the mountains were so big 
you could pretty much have to stick your head out the window to see the top of them. Like it was beautiful. Wow. It was just giant valleys and yeah, the whole of the Rocky Mountains. Just I can't recommend it enough to anyone. Beautiful spot. Amazing. Loved it. Yeah, I've never been to Canada, but it is on the bucket list for sure. Yeah. It sounds unreal. It is the best. Um, where was your favourite season and why? Favourite season, I think. I can a bit of a tie between my third winter season. That was when I was a, a better waiter. So I had yeah um, more of an enjoyable time and had good friends. Like we all kind of came really close to everyone I worked there. Mm-hmm. And that was Big White, yeah. Big White, yeah. And then the other place probably would have been that time I was in the house with 11 blokes in the, in the uh, summer because <laughs> we just got up to a lot of mischief and it was uh, yeah, a very good, very fun time. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Where's your favourite place to snowboard? I guess I'll keep, I'll keep talking about it, but probably Big White. <laughs> yeah. The main place I went to. And I just kind of, for me, it was, they had everything there, like the tree runs, they had open tree runs so you could kind of look practice. They had steep, they had just everything you needed there for me and there or um we liked uh Revelstoke. That was a really good mountain as well. Revelstoke okay. Mountain. It's very, very steep. But also lots of fun. Nice. And in your opinion, what's the best thing about season life or being a season heir in general? For me it'd probably be just everyone you meet, I think like all the people because everyone's there to do what you're doing, have fun, um, snowboard, ski. And I think because you meet everyone from everywhere all over the world, and so it kind of gives you a reason to, I guess, travel more to go visit them. You kind of bounce off of them. You might not know what you're doing at the end of the year, end of the season. So they say, "Oh, I'm going here. Oh, that sounds great. Might tag along." And then you just end up just meeting so many great people. Yeah, awesome. So obviously, we've been through your journey and heard quite a lot about your challenges. <laughs> quite, <laughs> yeah, quite um, scary challenges and unusual challenges um but can you tell us about a challenge or difficulty you faced during your season air journey and what did you learn from it but obviously we have heard a lot about <laughs> your challenges so um yeah a different i guess with me being like young and bad with the money i think in the summer when i was uh working those odd jobs i kind of really didn't mm-hmm put myself out there and I kind of was just a bit lazy with it I think when it came to finding a job I was like oh someone found me a job that'll do I think I needed to I kind of learned that I needed to put myself out there and kind of be a bit more smarter with money I think that was a, a challenge because I used to have I think I was like biscuits with ham on it for lunch really? and I'm working in 40, 40 degree heat and I'm just eating like nothing and I was yeah. um I'd be I wouldn't have like I used to I made a meal big meal once I was going to meal prep and I poured the chili in it and the lid came off and it was too hot to eat but I didn't have enough money so I just ate it anyway oh no so I was kind of just it was kind of just taught me I was like you need to figure your shit out (laughs) yeah 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 so that was definitely a challenge that kind of made me wake up a bit yeah definitely what's one thing you wish you had known before going on your first season how much you need to take how much money you need to take yeah <laughs> i yeah. see the theme here <laughs> i think like even though me not having money made a lot of good memories and kind of taught me a lot i yeah. think as long as there's a backup plan like a backup yeah. account where you know you, you want to live on a budget but if you know things go wrong you've, you've got that money to kind of sort yourself out mm-hmm. so i think uh, yeah money and <laughs> money (laughs) and uh, are there any opportunities or unlikely stories that stand out to you that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't have left South Australia in the first place probably just everything snow related like I remember sometime one day there's a certain spot you can snowboard to it's called they call it the knoll it's like a drinking spot on the mountain in, in Big White and I think I just stood there one time I was having a beer with my mates and we were just surrounded by snow capped mountains and I was just kind of like, this is so different. <laughs> like it was just blew my, absolutely blew my mind. Yeah. Like that, that really kind of was like, well, this is not, this doesn't happen in South Australia. Yeah, I get that all the time, actually, where I'll be on the mountain. I'll just be like, oh my God, like some people will never get to see this. It's yeah, like yeah. Incredible. Mm. So yeah, I totally uh, understand where you're coming from there. Um, throughout your travels, which place feels most like home to you? I think 
where I was, a town, a city called Penticton, where I kind of did that full year when I was living in, working at the winery. Mm-hmm. I kind of lived around the area before and it was just uh, very familiar in a way, I guess. I did like Big White, yeah. but it, for me it was just more, it's more like a, a holiday spot in a way. I did feel comfortable there, but it wasn't like a homely feeling in a way. I'd say more Penticton because I was there all year round and I had, had like a nice house and I had like good friends there and it kind of felt, yeah, more homely, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. When you're away, what do you miss most about your home country? Probably, I guess in a way, the food. I miss like yeah. classic Aussie meat pies and um, <laughs> chicken parmigianas and all that. Like, <laughs> food Vegemite. we get that a lot to be fair yeah. <laughs> Vegemite uh, I've never had Vegemite yeah, never uh, yeah. there's a special way to do it yeah. ask an Australian before you try it for sure alright I will yeah. but um, yeah probably yeah, family I think as well because it's been a while and they were pretty nervous for me to leave after my accident because <laughs> I nearly died I guess but yeah, I bet. while I was away my sister had a baby and it was the first one of the siblings so I was kind of a bit upset really wanted to be there at that time kind of thing. Um, yeah. That kind of made me feel a bit, a bit sad, but I did go end up go visiting. But I think, yeah, it's more thinking about everyone's lives moving on at home while you're trying to live your life, but it's still in the back of your mind that your family still moves on kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Mm. So if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Don't be lazy, I think. Yeah. When it came to making decisions I just made the one that was easier so it was more just like yeah finding jobs oh yeah that'll do kind of it was more like not trying to explore different options it was just whatever I thought was easy enough I probably would have made more money <laughs> like it would have had with them in those hardships and all that so I think I probably said yeah don't kind of just settle for the easy the easy way we talk a lot about mentors on the show did you have any mentors who helped you along in your journey uh yeah I think um Carl was definitely um Carl and my mate Phil they were the ones that were with me in like Asia and helped me out a lot. Mm. And I think they were a bit a lot older than me and had more travelled. So they kind of, uh, it, when I was like a young idiot, they kind of helped me direct me into the right path and make the right decisions. And mm. I think they definitely helped me along my travels for sure. Yeah, nice. Definitely. Yeah, he's a good egg, Carl. Yes, yeah, very good egg. Yeah, I'll be seeing him soon, actually. Are you? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, my mate Phil is getting married and his wedding party is in. Sheffield or well, start of September so I'm going to uh, Ireland I'm going to stay at my mate's place in England and going to Malta for three weeks awesome it's been a while since I've seen him so it'd be good to see him yeah excellent um do you have any quotes or sayings that you live by it's a bit of a I guess corny in a way I <laughs> it's more like a, I think they all are <laughs> yeah I remember when I was uh in hospital I had to get blood transfusions because I was obviously heaps of surgeries I think I had 42 of them wow yeah but my blood type was B positive <laughs> <laughs> so is that now you're saying yeah because I remember I remember I was like in the bed I looked at it and I was like B positive and I was like oh yeah B positive and I was like oh, I'm gonna do that <laughs> so that was just yeah just a bit of a, a, a corny one but just maybe yeah I still remember it yeah and kind of like and then uh yeah, it's probably bad. Anyway, I think just the old be positive. Well, for your situation at that time as well, I think it probably helped you massively to yeah. <laughs> maintain like a positive, positive attitude. So yeah, 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 love it. Do you have any books, movies, podcasts, or publications which you can recommend to our listeners that have helped you on your journey, or can you tell us something that has inspired you recently? I think when I was in Canada, I saw a movie called uh, "The Secret Life of Walter Mitty." I think it's called that one. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that was just about Ben Stiller traveling around trying to find this guy and he's going to all these beautiful places. And I think I saw it in Canada and it just made me think like what I'm doing now is awesome because you just, you see these beautiful places and I guess you watch a movie like that, watch a movie about traveling and it really kind of feeds you, you know, it gives you that travel bug. So I'd say yeah. definitely watch those kind of travel movies and you'll be, you'll be getting itchy feet for sure. What's one myth about season air life that you would like to debunk? Uh, probably that you need a job before you go. Mm-hmm. I think um, even though I did, when I was finishing at the winery, all I had to do was go to the resort, walk into the place, and I just said, do you have any jobs? And they're like, yeah, we've got this. And I was like, yeah, done. And it was yeah. that easy. So I think a lot of people get scared that they're going over there with no job. 
but I think in some instances it's actually quite easy to be there in person to actually get the job. Yeah. Yeah, it also depends where you go because if some some countries now you need a a working permit before you get granted a visa. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The open permits, I guess they are called, I think aren't they? Yeah, the open work permits. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh so now I'm gonna ask you my mum's favourite question. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What's one thing you take with you everywhere when you travel? Or do you have any travel hacks? I don't know. I think um if you're new to go into places that are cold, like a lot of jumpers and stuff aren't really the like if you have a good lot of a few layers, I think that'll be enough. Like I mm-hmm. went over first with so many jumpers and jackets thinking I'm gonna die over there in the cold. But once you have a you get you get used to it. So I think um for me it'd be the hack would be don't bring so much if you're going for a winter thing. Yeah. You get a few good layers on you and I think you'll be fine because you've got to be taking them off everywhere when you go inside. <laughs> yeah. Overall, what's the biggest lesson learned from living and working abroad? Probably I think would be learning how to be more independent because I've moved over when I was so like, young and fresh out of home. Got a big, very, very big lesson about uh, just kind of money managing, learning how to pay rent properly, um, and signing over leases, pretty much learn how to be an adult. <laughs> like, was, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Is there anything that seasonal life has brought to your current life? I guess I, I love for life in a way. I don't know, like. Yeah makes you kind of want to plan a holiday in a way because you've done all the traveling, you know, what it's all like. You've got that experience. So you know that when life starts to get a bit boring, you, know, you get that travel bug again. You can you can start tra- planning and traveling. You know what to do now. So yeah, you've got everything ready for you. So you just got to start planning pretty much. Yeah, nice. It's more like the uh, planning experience of holidays from traveling around. Kind of brought that to the life so I can be a bit smarter with my holidays. Yeah, for sure. If you hadn't gone and done your first season, what do you think you'd be doing right now? I think I'd probably still be in the wine industry. I'd probably be mm-hmm. probably at the same job. I worked at a very big commercial place near where I grew up. Probably yeah, doing the same thing, I reckon, just making wine. And you still enjoy doing it? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's kind awesome. of it can be different things every day, so it kind of keeps you entertained. It doesn't get too boring and monotonous, so it's good. Is there anyone you'd like to nominate to come on the show and have a chat with me? Uh, yeah, I think um, a mate Phil that was uh, with me in my travels. He's got a he's a bit of a, uh, a larrikin, so he'd have a few stories I think to tell. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> especially the ones I was there with him. And then there's this guy I worked with. I thought about this this morning. That he I worked with him at Threadbow in Australia for the winter season, and I think he did ten winters in a row. Oh wow. And he went back and forth from like Australia, Japan, or like in the States. And I think he'd have yeah, plenty of stories to tell. I think he's doing his 13th this year. Yeah, hopefully you can put me in touch with those guys. That'd be awesome. Definitely can. Uh, so what's next for you? Pretty much just working and I've got a yeah, trip over. Going to go see my mates Phil and Carl over in the UK and kind of um, just keep working. I'm trying to work my way up the uh, winery ladder in a way. So Nice. And then hopefully... Do a bit more traveling around. I've got a few more vintages overseas in me, I think. I don't know if my age does, but I do. But um, <laughs> depend, depending on visas. But how old are you? Twenty nine in a couple of weeks. Okay, so you got a little bit of time. A little bit. Yeah, of time, just depending on where you go, I think as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think some are thirty five, some are thirty. But, uh, yeah. Good luck with that. And um, what's one parting piece of advice for anyone thinking about becoming a seasonaire or starting a new adventure? I guess. In a way, if you just just do it, like you know, I know, like if you're been on the edge about it, there's a lot of people in the same boat, and I think a lot of people you meet a lot of people in your situation. I think when you get over there, that are also you get nervous; it's their first time as well, so you kind of make friends through that. And like I've been saying for the most of the time, is just have some money. <laughs> yeah, have some. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just to get you out of any kind of sticky situations. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great advice. But if you don't, you probably have another memory. (laughs) Very true. (laughs) (laughs) Bryce, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have a chat with you. Thank you so much for making the time with the time difference and everything. Thank you very much. It's been awesome. Awesome. Wow. I am in a glass cage of emotion after listening to that one. Thanks again to the courageous Bryce Russell for coming on the show today. 
Do you know someone who's been thinking of becoming a seasonaire or starting a new journey? Maybe you're sick of people saying, you're so lucky, I wish I could do that, and asking for advice. If this sounds like you, it would mean the absolute world to me if you could spread the word and share this show with your mates. Every subscribe and share counts, and it really does make a difference. As always, thanks to Mike at Mike Sports Bar for the studio space. Thanks to sponsors Dope Snow. Thanks to Mondo Wave for the music. And thanks to you guys for tuning in. See you all again next time. Dodgy microphones. All See, good. I told you it'd be me. It'd be me that does something wrong. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Trying to be professional, but not that professional. That's all good, yeah. <laughs> Basically, oh, just been winging it for a couple of years. So. <laughs>